Hey guys, welcome to Lifestar Pre-Training video podcast for the month of October. During the month of October, we are going to be discussing a certain type of stroke that I bet is not on your radar and some of the tools you can use in the back of the ambulance to help you with this. But for the pre-training podcast, I want to talk about the efficacy of thrombolytics. Now to talk about thrombolytics, we need to realize that there are three different types of strokes. And we're going to start off with the hemorrhagic stroke because this is the direct contraindication to giving TPA. We know this is going to make up about 13% of the strokes that we see according to the 2015 AHA guidelines. Hemorrhagic strokes have a very high mortality rate and these patients do not do well. The second type of stroke is a thrombus that forms within the cerebral artery and we call this a thrombotic stroke. This is where the clot is lodged exactly where it was formed. The third is going to be the embolism or the embolic stroke. And this is where a piece of that thrombus breaks off and goes in transit. It's going to lodge itself in the next narrowest vessel that it lands in. This is why during patients who are in atrial fibrillation, when they're getting ready to get cardioverted, sometimes get a transesophageal echo. They go in the, in the esophagus and they look to see if they see any clots that are forming or in transit in the left atrium or the right atrium. Now, let's look at the heart here. We see we have this little clot that's forming, and we'll say it's in the left atrial appendage. It's going to break off, come loose, float up the carotid artery or the vertebral artery, and plant itself somewhere in the cerebral arteries. Now, to understand how TPA works, we need to understand part of the clotting cascade. Now, we know the clotting cascade is very confusing and has lots of components to it. But for the sake of this podcast, I want you guys to understand the basic layout of the clot foundation. Now these little scribbly lines are we're going to call fibrin. And this fibrin is what kind of holds that clot together. This is what gives that clot its sturdiness and its strength. Now these little guys that look like Pac-Men on the outside around it are the plasminogen. Now what's going to happen is that TPA is going to come in, it's going to bind to the plasminogen, and it's going to convert that to plasmin. Now, plasmin, I want you to think of plasmin as giving a little kid a hammer and telling him to go to town. It's going to start breaking down those fibrin strands and start helping degradate that clot. Now, look at these two buildings here, right? We see the building on the right and the building on the left. Now, imagine we took that kid with the hammer and we dropped him off on that building on the right. We let him walk onto that job site and we told him we want him to tear down that building as fast as he could. He's not going to be able to do it. This building is way too developed, and he's not going to be able to do all this with a hammer, right? Now look on the left side. We see that this building is in its incipient stages. We see there's very little framing done, and it's going to be very easy for him to knock down that wall. Why is this important? Because TPA does not work well on old clots. The longer the clot is there, the more time it has to build up fibrin, and the stronger it gets. So, with that being said, how many strokes are caused by old clots? Well, the answer is we don't know. When somebody presents with ischemic stroke symptoms, that's all we know is that they're presenting with stroke symptoms. We get them that CT right away, we make sure there's not a bleed, but once we see a hypodense spot on the CT, we really don't know if that's an old clot or a new clot that's forming that, a thrombus or an embolism. What we do know is that the direct area of infarct is going to die within three minutes. That's right, three minutes. So why do we say that we have a time frame of three to 4.5 hours to get them in? It's because of this area around the infarct called the penumbra. The penumbra is the area of still viable and salvageable tissue that if we can reperfuse with TPA, we can still save. So let's look at that three to 4.5 hour window. We know that the three hour window has been approved by the FDA. Now the three to 4.5 hours, the 4.5 hour, some patients might meet that criteria. However, it has not been FDA approved, but is suggested by the 2015 AHA guidelines. So how are we gonna dose this? Well, we're gonna give 0.9 milligrams per kilogram. Then we're gonna take 10% of that bolus and we're gonna give it over one minute. The rest is going to be given over one hour. Now, because this is dosed so carefully, we want to make sure that we take the pump with us. We don't want to be messing around with trying to switch a half set and a full set and wasting some of the drug on the ground. We want to make sure that the patient is getting every bit of the drug, and we want to make sure we take the patient's 
and the facilities pump with us. We're not going to switch this over to our pump. This is one of those circumstances where it's okay to take that transport uh, pump from the facility. Now, when we're watching somebody who is currently getting TPA, we want to make sure that we keep that blood pressure controlled. And what do I mean by controlled? Well, if we see that systolic jump up above 180 or the diastolic jump up above 105, we need to think about using some sort of agent to bring down that, that blood pressure. And the agents that the AHA recommends is labetalol and nicardipine. Now, if we're going to give labetalol, AHA recommends giving 10 milligrams IV followed by a continuous IV infusion of 2 to 8 milligrams per minute. Or if we want to give nicardipine, we can give it IV 5 milligrams an hour and titrate up to the desired effect by 2.5 milligrams an hour every 5 to 15 minutes with a maximum of 15 milligrams per hour. Now, if both of those don't work, we can consider using sodium nitroprusside. Now, TPA is not without its risks, and I found it pretty interesting to look at some of the studies that were done and how little evidence there is that it actually has a beneficial outcome for patients. So there were 12 studies that were done while this was being approved by the FDA. Ten of those studies came back negative, showing there was absolutely no, benefic uh, no beneficial outcome for patients, and four of those ten were interrupted because they were actually causing harm to patients. That leaves us with two positive studies. So let's look at these studies. And what I want to show you is a website called the NNT. And that is the number needed to treat. And you can go to the NNT.com. And if you type in thrombolytics for acute ischemic stroke, you can see it pops up right away and tells us that there was no benefit found. So what it does is the NNT looks at all the studies for that medication and tells us the number needed to treat. How many patients do you need to treat before one patient is helped by it? So if we look up here, we can see the number needed to harm. 1 in 20 were harmed, and we can see that the most um, common finding was symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. So let's look at this now. Let's look at these studies that were done. So we can see the MAPS study that was done in Italy in 1995 showed no benefit. The ECAS study in 1995, no benefit. The NINS-1 study, overall, no benefit. The NINS-2 study, which they actually stopped the NINS-1 study halfway through it and realized that they weren't having beneficial outcomes, so they changed their, um, their outcome and their endpoint in the middle of the study, which if they were to do that to a study these days, that study would not even be entertained at. You don't start a study, realize you're not getting the outcome you want, and then change it and then have a favorable outcome. So the NINS-2 study has some flaws and uh, something they call data mining, where they actually go in and change the uh, outcome to try to make it look like they had a benefit from it. Uh, the other discrepancies within the NIN study was that the patients that received the placebo actually had a more severe uh, stroke and had a higher NIH score. Now we look at the MASS study that was done in Europe in 1996, and this was stopped early due to intracranial hemorrhage and mortality. And then we look at the ASK study in 1996, stopped early due to mortality. And then we see the ECAS-2, no benefit. The Atlantis-B stopped early because unlikely to prove beneficial. The Atlantis I stopped early for harm. The DIAS study, uh, no benefit. And then we have the ECAS-3 study, which showed a uh, number needed to treat of 15 for favorable outcomes. So we know that the AHA actually gives uh, TPA a 1A evidence for uh, the use of it, which is pretty weird to base that off of uh, one or two studies to give that type of recommendation. So I do encourage you to look at this. Um, it's important to understand how evidence-based medicine works and how we need to understand how this works. Now, we're not going to be giving this drug. Uh, we're not going to be initiating it. We're going to probably be transporting it. But it's still important to realize the, uh, the studies that were done behind it as well. So I hope you guys appreciated this uh, podcast, and we hope to see everybody in the October training. Thanks for listening.